Mr Patton. Uh, thanks, President. Um, I rise to speak to this bill, the Health Legislation Amendment and Repeal Bill. And, and as many others have spoken before me, this is an omnibus bill that covers a whole range of areas, that, um, particularly around information sharing. Um, I won't go into those segments of the bill. I think they're largely uncontroversial. Uh, the, the bill also is said to strengthen existing tobacco and e-cigarette advertising prohibitions, and it also repeals the Access to Cannabis Act, the Access to Medicinal Cannabis Acts, um, which makes consequential amendments to other acts. Um, I'd like to touch on the, medic the section repealing the Medicinal Cannabis Act and speak about an amendment that I will bring to the House today. But I'd also like to start by speaking around um, the e-cigarette advertising. Now, I note in, um, in the second reading speech, the Minister says, the pervasive and harmful impact of smoking and tobacco and e-cigarette advertising. Now, let's be quite clear about what an e-cigarette is. For one, it is not a cigarette. It is a device. It is an electronic device. And we are comparing it with a combustible tobacco product. We're comparing an electronic device and saying that in itself that this electronic tobacco, this electronic device is dangerous, even if you put water in it. That somehow this is as dangerous as smoking and as tobacco. Now that is preposterous. Absolutely preposterous. And I, you know, in 2016, when we first had these conversations, I tried very hard to convince this government that we should separate and we should regulate um, uh, nicotine, non-combustible you know, non nicotine products. And I thought, and I have, the more I've learned since 2016, the more committed I am to the fact that governments should be regulating this, not pushing it into the black market, which is exactly what we're doing now. I have to admit, um, and I will say that under privilege, that I am a criminal. I vape and I do not have a prescription for it. Now, according to Victorian law, if I want to use a, a vaping device and I want to use nicotine in it, I must get a prescription for it. Now, I have to say I will get a prescription for it. However, that, what that prescription provides me is absolutely nothing except something to show customs. When I go and buy from some Chinese company offshore a, a juice that I might use in the, the vaping device that I have that I legally bought in Australia. That does not protect me. The government is not doing anything to protect me. This bill is not doing anything. In fact, I think Mr Limbrick's um, uh, amendments about um, allowing greater demonstration and display of these products does help protect the consumer. What I would like to see is this government regulate the industry. This government ensure that those devices that are being sold are safe. That the e-juices, the juices that are being used in those devices, um, whether they contain nicotine or not, that we know what's in those juices. That there is some regulation about the packaging of those juices so that we don't have, as we did just some months ago, the very tragic circumstance where a young child died after consuming some juice that contained nicotine. That was absolutely tragic. And what we did is we said, let's keep prohibiting it. Let's keep um, having this product being sourced overseas. Nicotine is a very, very addictive um, product. We know that. We know that. But you know what? People smoke to get the nicotine, but it's the smoking that kills them. It's not the nicotine. So we are seeing remarkable success in people moving from the very dangerous habit of smoking to get their nicotine to the far less dangerous. I'm not saying it's harmless and I'm not saying it's safe. I'm just saying that it is far less harmful use of getting their nicotine through a vaping device. Um, so to lump these products in with tobacco is misleading, it's misguiding, and it does not keep our community safe. Now, I, I acknowledge that Victoria, in actual fact, has been one of the leaders in harm minimisation in tobacco. I believe we were the first state to prohibit tobacco advertising at sporting events. Um, 
that we have been at the lead in these areas. Australia is considered a leader in harm minimisation around smoking. Um, but we are losing that. We are losing that um, title of being one of the world leaders. We are also losing the battle on the cessation of smoking. Our smoking levels have plateaued and they have for the last few years. But guess what? The countries where vaping is, um, is, is allowed, is legal, and in many cases, such as the UK and, the, and New Zealand, is actually endorsed by the government, they are seeing their, their smoking rates continue to decline. Now, I look at, um, I just, you know, I heard the federal minister um, just the other week at the press club saying, he announced that by 2025, we will have a target of 10% smoking rates in Australia. Now, it sounded familiar because the health minister in 2010 said, by 2025, we will have smoking rates of 10%. Um, we have plateaued. New Zealand has got a towards zero um, goal by 2025. They estimate that less than 5% of their community will, will, use, um, will use combustible tobacco to get nicotine in their community. Um, in Australia, we have plateaued. Other states, even the UK, um, has less smokers. You look at somewhere like Japan, where they have the, um, the heat not burn tobacco products, they have seen an enormous drop in their smoking rates. Absolutely enormous, like a plummet um, decline in their smoking rates. I, I understand that people say we don't know enough about this product, there's not enough research. I can tell you, if we put that same test, we would not have a polio vaccination. We would not have the pill. Um, you know, we know, and the science tells us, and we can rely on the science, the science tells us that this is not as harmful as copying a mouthful of carbon monoxide, tar, and the, other, and the thousands of chemicals that are in tobacco. Tobacco and those chemicals that we don't even list. We don't even care what the tobacco companies put in those products. We seem to care an awful lot about e-cigarettes. So I think we shouldn't be banning e-cigarette advertising. In many other countries, they're doing quite the opposite. They are actually promoting e-cigarettes because they see it as a way of saving lives. They see it as a way of getting smokers off cigarettes. They see it as a way of saving the lives, of the saving the grief of families losing their parents, losing their children. Um, but here we just get a just say no. So I'm very supportive of um, the, the modest amendments that uh, Mr Limbrick has put to this House because in 2016 we recognised that there were some stores that were um, only selling um, e e vaping, vaping devices. And these were devices that were electronic devices. And at the time, the government said, well, they shouldn't be able to display them, they shouldn't be able to demonstrate them, they shouldn't even be able to take them out of the box. Now, we allowed for a grandfather clause for those existing stores, and now I understand that this legislation, um, that while that grandfather clause remains, any new stores and any new businesses that want to sell these devices must sell them like they are selling a tobacco product. Yet, this device contains no tobacco. It actually contains no nicotine. It is an electronic device, and yet somehow we are treating it like a combustible tobacco product. It makes absolutely no sense, and I, I, I hope one day we will see some leadership in this area. Um, to turn to the repeal of the medicinal cannabis legislation, and, and I, I, I would really like to commend the Victorian government for taking the lead on the introduction of the Medicinal Cannabis Act. It acted as a catalyst, and it certainly was the right thing to do at the time. It responded to the needs of our community, to the demands of our community for access to this very good medicine. And the legislation that we developed really did nudge the federal government to jump up and act and introduce federal legislation, albeit not very good legislation federally, but legislation nonetheless. And so I think 
Victoria can be very proud for what we did at that time. And so the fact that we no longer need our, um, uh, the legislation here and the fact that it's redundant um, is quite right. The fact that it duplicates what's happening federally, the fact that it might sometimes um, mislead people to think that there's these two levels of, regula of regulation, that that might provide, that might look at it, it, it might look at like it's an increased burden on the industry, um, that regulatory duplication might be seen as a disincentive to people wanting to get involved in the industry, whether that's as a, as a medical provider, as a doctor, or as, as someone growing. So I, I agree. So that is why I'm, I, I would like to place an amendment onto this bill um, to further streamline access to medicinal cannabis in this state. I'm wondering if we could circulate my amendment, please, uh, President. Could Ms Patton's amendments be circulated, please? Thanks, Ms Patton. Uh, th thank you, President. So my amendments are designed to streamline the prescribing pathway for medicinal cannabis. And, and I think given the, the government's announcements about expanding some of the trials for young children with epilepsy to, to further increase the access to medicinal cannabis, the fact that they recognise that um, the, the, the it, by repealing the Medicinal Cannabis Act in Victoria, it again, you know, ensures that there is no duplication, ensures that there is um, no confusion um, and increased burden, burdens on industry uh, for an, enabling people to do this. So currently in Victoria, um, state, level is, state level approval is required for federally auth authorised prescribers of THC products or, that are considered Schedule 8 this is medicinal cannabis, that may have a component of THC in it. This means that a medical practitioner has to apply se separately to both state and federal departments for approval to prescribe medicinal cannabis. Now, while the federal TGA has improved its turnaround for approvals, and doctors tell me it's now about two to three hours, state level approvals still can take a while. And I, I look and I appreciate that some of those could turn around quite quickly, but there are circumstances where it's taken two to four days as well. And generally the average time for the state approval is about 48 hours. Now this is 48 hours for a very sick patient. We might be talking about a patient who is undertaking chemotherapy, who is struggling to swallow food, who is struggling um, to keep food down, and the medicinal cannabis product could greatly alleviate that and bring great comfort to that person in a very difficult time of their life. So forcing that very sick person to have to wait at least another two days for this product seems, um, seems uh, cruel and it certainly isn't compassionate as, as I would like to think we are. Uh, and also it's unnecessary. We have a federal approval system through the Therapeutic Goods Authority. So these are products that are being approved, the doctors, the, the prescription is being approved by the federal level, and yet that approval must be duplicated at a state level. Now I've heard, I've heard some people concerned that, that this would open it up to, to, to other cannabis products, that we might see Victorian doctors who didn't have to get the double check off, one from the federal, one from the state, that they, that they might all of a sudden start providing illicit products through their surgeries. And um, this is not the case. These doctors must um, be approved, the prescriptions must be approved at that federal level. So I think, as we have seen in New South Wales and Queensland, they have streamlined this system by suggesting that that, that approval system that happens at that federal level is appropriate. Now, I have put some exemptions into that, and I've said when a doctor is, in my, in my amendments, when a doctor is prescribing uh, the medicinal cannabis to a person who is drug dependent, or when they're prescribing to supply for a clinical trial, or 
they're prescribing to treat a child, then certainly the state should provide some approval um, in those circumstances. But in the other circumstances where we have a very thorough and robust federal system, I see no reason why we would duplicate this red tape at a state level. Uh, the, this model, as I mentioned, has already been introduced in New South Wales and a, um, a simpler version has been introduced in Queensland. We are seeing various models um, where the states are removing themselves from the equation uh, happening around Australia. And I think as Victoria steps out of re regulating medicinal cannabis, these, these repeals and these amendments make, um, make a, lot of, a lot of sense. And also it will help, it will just, it will slightly help those thousands of Victorians who want to access this material. It will slightly help um, with those doctors who are considering prescribing it, but, but they look at it and they go, if I prescribe OxyContin, which is a Schedule 8, I must, um, I must get approval from the state. Um, but if I'm to prescribe medicinal cannabis, I must get approval from the federal government and approval from the state. So it gives this sort of appearance that somehow that medicinal cannabis product is more dangerous and is more harmful than other Schedule 8 products or other products that require, require state approval but don't require federal approval. So I hope that, um, I understand that the government is not going to support this, but I would, I would um, implore them to look at streamlining systems so the thousands of Victorians who are not accessing medicinal cannabis through legal means could find greater ways. And this would encourage more doctors to become prescribers, which would inevitably help the industry that is growing the medicinal cannabis in Victoria. And obviously it would help the patients who desperately want this product. I'd just finally like to speak quickly um, to, to Ms Crozier's amendments um, about further uh, requiring reporting, reporting um, for the, uh, the uh, medically supervised injecting room in North Richmond. Now, as many people know, this is a trial. This, this is just, um, this is, uh, it has just completed the first year of its trial. Uh, the legislation has very strict reg, uh, reporting within the, the legislation itself currently. Um, I contacted, and, and at, one, at one point when I was considering these amendments, I, I thought, well, this is great because I think the Medically Supervised Injecting Centre is doing extremely well. It is saving lives. We have not seen overdoses there. It is providing pathways to other health services. It is providing pathways to things like hepatitis C treatment, pathways into rehabilitation. Um, yes, maybe we should be shouting these successes from the rafters. But as I looked into this more deeply, the, the, the burden that this would place on a very small centre that is under, is, is under trial and in a community health centre would um, would be above and beyond their capability. Uh, I would like to note that as of on last Friday, uh, they reported that there was 2,908 registered clients using the service, 61,823 visits, including the super, went to the service, used the service, and 1,232 overdoses were safely managed by the staff inside. Um, they either, they, quite often they didn't need opiate reversing medication like, like naloxone, they could just use oxygen. So this has proved to be a remarkably um, successful service and so I, um, I and in speaking to, to, the, to the managers there uh, and the workers there, they, they convinced me of their, their considerable concerns about the overreach of uh, Ms Crozier's amendment. Um, so as I've highlighted, we are seeing this government pushing us into black markets and that does not make our community safer. And whether that's because patients can't access medicinal cannabis easily or smokers cannot try a, a less harmful alternative to getting their nicotine. Uh, I, am, I am troubled by this legislation. I won't oppose this legislation, but I do implore this government to reconsider their positions, to look at New Zealand, to look at the UK, to look at the success of alternative nicotine products when regulated and used safely. Thank you.